You are now rocking with the best. Hoops and Hip Hop with Coach Carter on the White Label Radio Network. Yo, check one, two, one, two, and I say one, two. What's up, y'all? This is Coach Carter, Hoops and Hip Hop Podcast. And uh, I have a very special guest in the building. Um, let's run down some list of accolades and uh, take him back a little bit. He was a 24th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, 18 seasons in the NBA, five-time NBA champ, coached in the NBA, WNBA, uh, played with Shaq, played with Kobe, uh, father, husband, philanthropist. Yes. Uh, all the above. I'm sitting here with the one and only Coach Derek Fisher. <laughs> What's up, Coach? How you What's doing? Up, I'm good, Coach. I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm good, man. So uh, take us back. So let's start at the very beginning. Little, Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, that what is, is the beginning. <laughs> what does that mean to you? Uh, that's home. Um, it means family. Uh, it means faith. It means foundation. Um, you know, it, it means humility because uh, there was, you know, it wasn't like we, you know, we weren't, I would say, impoverished in a way that we always had somewhere to live. We always had, you know, a roof over our head. We, we you know, we had food, maybe not a lot sometimes, but we weren't. You know, there are families that had it worse than us. Um, but Little Rock for sure reminds me uh, of what most of our life experiences really are and, and how fortunate, you know, we are in L.A. and in California to some degree and to be able to do the things we do and have these experiences. Like Little Rock reminds me of how fortunate I am and, and how far I've come and how blessed I am to have lived this life with still hopefully so much more life to live. Yes, sir. It's funny because um, my introduction to Little Rock, Arkansas, um, I have family out in the South. Oh, all of us have family in the South yeah. in some, some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, Banging in Little Rock. Yeah. It was a documentary. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> they out there getting it in Little Rock. I thought LA was the the... But it, it's but do you, so was that in your area where you was at where you lived at? Yeah, I mean Little Rock's a small city, even though it's the capital city of the state. Um, and you know there was LA influence in terms of the 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 level of gang activity, um, the level of gang activity that we started to experience in Little Rock was influenced by some guys from the West Coast, yeah. you know, kind of coming down and, and kind of turning that on and, and yeah. getting that going down there. And I wasn't involved in gang activity, but just due to sheer lack of numbers, I knew a lot of those guys, yeah. a lot yeah. of that went down, whether in my neighborhood or a neighborhood one mile over. Yeah, yeah. It, It's not that big. So um, when the documentary came out, it it, it – was bittersweet in a sense because it I thought there was some positive to people seeing what really was going on in Little Rock while at the same time a lot of these cats I, I knew or you know went to school with uh, and saw like banging Little Rock kind of reinforced this idea of how important it is to in terms of like the choices you make in your life yeah, yeah. I easily could have been on TV for other reasons. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So for those that don't know, "Banging a Little Rock" was a documentary about gang or violent culture in Little Rock, and the way it transpired. I guess some LA cats went out there and kind of set up gangs like they had in LA. Yeah. Um, and pretty much turned the city out, and actually had them uh, had them banging gang, yeah. gang banging in Little Rock Arkansas which is a small town compared to Los Angeles or New York or whatever and that was our introduction to Little Rock for the most part of course like I said we had family out that way but um but uh, so when I when I heard that you came from Little Rock I'm like you can understand the magnitude or the trenches that a person comes from based on yeah. their environment or whatever so um 
What was like hooping in Little Rock during your high school, college times? Yeah, it was, um, you know, different. Obviously, than now there there's so much more availability of, you know, in terms of resources and, and, and gyms and, uh, you know, coaches and trainers and, and people that want to try and help you get better. Um, you know, so you sometimes it was outside. You know, I mean, my dad and I used to go to the park sometimes and with a weight vest jacket and, and, <laughs> and do defensive slides and line drills and sprints and just different things to try to get better. Um, but it was also like uh, a, an, an, a space and time where you had to like work really, 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 really hard just to get a chance to get out on the court. Yeah. Right. Like playing time wasn't guaranteed. Your spot on the team wasn't guaranteed. There was nothing about it that said you could not put your all into it and still expect results, still expect performance, still expect your coach or your school to just, or just because you showed up and you've been, you think you've been working hard over the summer, that means you're supposed to get something. Yeah. Um, that was kind of what it was like. Like you had to earn everything. And that's, you know, sharing that with the boys now. You know, at Crespi, like, bro, this is it's no handouts around here. Like, yeah. whether my kids are on the team or not, we're not handing out free tickets. Like, you gotta <laughs> you gotta go get it in order for you to earn your opportunity. So not because you just showed up, you get a participation nah, spot. Nah, no, none of and that. I, no, and I think there's some positive to that, right? It, it it's there is a space for recreational and participation type of, you know, in terms of teams and, and, and leagues. And, you know, we grew up, there was more like boys and girls clubs and rec centers. Yep. It wasn't necessarily like club team where parents were paying money to participate. I know that's something that, you know, we've talked about. And that seems to have raised the stakes of expectation when in reality, even though some families are paying, it's still just like a boys and girls club rec team. Yeah. And yeah, there in some ways there can be uh, equal opportunity or participation in some of those situations, but then in other situations, it's not. If, yeah. if your son or daughter isn't good enough to make the team or get consistent playing time, it's not be it's not for personal reasons. It's not politics. It's, it's performance not, based. It's performance based. Yeah. I, I don't know many coaches, and I know there are some situations where it's you know, a parent or a whatever that they feel like, oh, well, that kid's only getting playing time because of X. Yeah. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Yeah. I would say a majority of the coaches and a high majority are pretty much basing playing time on who they feel like is going to help them win the most. Yeah. Because coaches want to win too. And depending on what level you're at, coaches only can keep their job if the team is winning. 100%. 100%. Do you feel like now that you're in the high school coaching ranks and your sons are on the team, do you get some of that? Yeah, I think there is definitely a perception uh, from some people that, one, the only reason I'm doing it is because of that. And then, two, whatever ends up happening during the course of the season, you know, if one of my boys is in in the fourth quarter, instead of somebody else's son, they're, they're automatically going to assume yeah. well, his son is only in because of... Especially if he, if he misses a shot or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah. a mistake that any players anybody could make. 100%. Um, so that, that is going to be there, uh, and that's something that we'll, we'll have to manage as a family and manage as a team. Yeah. Um, my hope is that through transparency and communication with parents, with families, with staff, with the players directly, um, and them seeing how I move and practice every day and the way I communicate, the way I hold my sons accountable, just like I do other guys on the team, uh, that they they won't – the player may not feel that even though all of us as parents, we already know. Yeah. Like anything yeah. that yeah. <laughs> it look like somebody treating our baby <laughs> the wrong way, we just – we off top, we're going to react a certain way. 100%. And I understand that, and I just want to make sure that parents feel like they have a small space to – 24 hours later. <laughs> yes, yes. That is you know, that's important. That's yeah, important. To, to find a respectful way to put your hand up and communicate with the coach and say, hey, here's my concern. Or here's what I think should be happening. 
and then give me as a coach a chance to share with you my thoughts and then let's 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 move on 100 percent, 100 percent. so let's take it back to little rock again so when you was in high school um was there a lot of college interest in you or did little rock was the only school involved as far as your recruiting or our interest yeah the process kind of was up and down a little bit like i went to some of the exposure camps kind of not the biggest ones but uh, you know my high school coach took a few of us to some of the exposure camps i started to get interest from kind of some of the texas teams rice university uh texas a&m baylor you know kind of that area and but that started like the spring and summer going into my senior year in high school because i didn't play varsity until i was a senior yeah so most of these teams didn't really see me until that summer before my senior year Mm -hmm. on the club team circuit. Yeah. And so those schools wanted me to kind of decide, but, you know, going to school there, offer the scholarship. And there was something about the fact that my process had started so late. I didn't want to rush into choosing a school in the early signing period. Yeah. I didn't understand the way the game is played, you know, that after the early signing period, it's pretty much done. <laughs> everybody got their spots. Everybody got their spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> but so I decided that, you know, the high school season meant something to me. Um, and I decided I wanted to just focus on the season and then I'll worry about that after. Yeah. Um, and so then those schools that wanted to sign me early, you know, they went to the other guy and offered him a scholarship and signed him. So by the time I got to that late signing period, Little Rock was essentially the only for sure D1 scholarship offer that I had, but I also wanted they had just joined the Sun Belt Conference. Okay. And I thought it was a uh, compared to some of the other schools, it was a good step up in competition within the conference where like a legit mid-major conference that if I was able to play in that conference I felt like I would get better. I would play against good competition on a regular basis. And how involved were your parents in this whole process? They they were involved, uh, you know, to some degree. Like my dad for sure encouraged me to like still apply to schools, even you know through academic scholarship opportunities. And mean, and there was a couple of schools that I had to really think about. Like, okay, if I accept an academic scholarship to this school and my GPA gets below 3.75, then I'm going to lose my academic scholarship. Yeah. Which then means that puts my whole experience at that school in jeopardy. Yeah. So even if I wanted to walk on or even if I wanted to play basketball, if I can't even stay at the school because I lost my scholarship, then that's going to be a problem. So, um, so my dad was involved from that perspective. And my parents were always great at guiding and offering support, but never driving the process. They really, they only had to really like go into my high school coach's office one time because they found out he was kind of stashing some of my, the letters that were coming in for me. (laughs) He was stashing and making sure that other guys that he felt like had more potential than me were getting really looked at. Yeah. So how did you you find out? My mom and dad told me that it was happening. How did they find out? I'm not sure to be, I can't even remember coach to be honest with you. And that's the only time they went in there, like, with they had something to say. <laughs> I, I had the same experience, but it was a few years later, I ran into some coaches at an open run and said, where you been? I reached out to your coach a couple of times. And I'm like, I've been here. I've been. Yeah. By that time, I had a job at UPS, and I was already kind of moving on or whatever. But it's it's crazy how that happened to you as, as well as me or whatever. Um, did that sour your relationship with your coach? For... A short period of time it did, but I also kind of, I couldn't let it ruin my, you know, my performance though. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing where like, and I try to tell young players this now, like you may not like your high school, college, or if you're fortunate enough to play in college or pros, you may not like your coach at all. Yeah. (laughs) You might not like the general manager of the team at all, Mm -hmm. the athletic director of the school at all. That has little to nothing to do with how you perform on the court, though. 100%. Whether you like him or her or not, 
you made her miss the free throws. Yes. You made her miss, you know, the shot. You turned the ball over, not the coach from the sideline. Yeah. Uh, so I think it did – I think it just sharpened this idea that, like, I can't leave it up to other people to do for me what I want to do for myself. 100%. Yes. Like, whether it's your high school coach, your this, your, your whatever, like, there are always going to be people that are rooting against you, hoping you don't succeed, telling you you're not going to succeed, essentially hating, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> That, that's going to always exist no matter who you are. And I think that experience kind of crystallized that for me at a young age. And that's something I've always carried with me in terms of like how I approach situations. Like I'm just going to work my butt off and not really get too caught up in, you know, what I, other people may try to say or think or imply. It's like when you look back at it, you're not going to really, you might say he wasn't perfect, but you're not going to say he didn't work hard and he didn't give his all. He didn't put his best into this. Yeah. Yeah. So you go through Little Rock, um, University of Little Rock. You're the player of the year in the Sun Belt Conference. Um, when did you start to realize that the NBA was probably in your in your future? Oof. I mean, the short answer is it wasn't until – Commissioner David Stern called my name. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the really the short answer. And even then, whether or not I was going to stay, you know, that was a whole separate, you know, kind of conversation. Um, my, my sophomore year, like the summer before my sophomore year in college, my my older brother, um, he used to spend some time with John Lucas in the summer down in Houston. Okay. And uh, my older brother has, you know, great player, um, has some substance abuse challenges and things that he's worked through. He's oof, probably 27, 28 years now clean and sober. Nice. Um, yeah, no, it's it's amazing the journey that he's been on. And, and that kind of threw off his NBA opportunity. He made it, but it just, you know, it got to him. Yeah. And at that time, the NBA was much more harsh – on you know guys that had any involvement with any type of drugs or anything it was just like nah bro you done mm -hmm. um so uh the summer before my sophomore year in college i went down to houston to spend a week with my brother because he was down in houston training going to rehab getting his life right and there was a bunch of other nba guys down there going through the same rehab program um so they would take classes go to rehab then they would lift weights and train and then get on the court individual skill training, five on five. And when I went to Houston for the week, I got in on the workouts and the five on five. Yeah. And at that time, I might've even been against the rules of the NCAA or whatever yeah. to even do that, I don't even know. <laughs> but, um, and by the end of that week, John Lucas Sr. And most, if you don't know John Lucas, there is a John Lucas the third. Yes. Um, Oh, that's my phone. It's all good. Keep going. Yeah, no, there is a John Lucas the third that uh, he's an assistant coach for the uh, the Phoenix Suns now, but his his dad, um, John Lucas, uh, yeah, basketball guru, um, super OG. He, By played, the he played for the Sixers. Yeah, he played for the Sixers. Yes. I feel like he played for the Houston Rockets as yep, well. He did. Yes. He's been an assistant coach in the NBA for a long time. One of the most well respected men in basketball period and by the end of the week he kind of pulled me to the side and he was like hey hey young fella like how old are you and i was like i mean i'm you know i think i was seven 18 19 at that time okay and, and he was like well you know what what year how many years of school do you have left and i said three because i was going into my sophomore year in college mm -hmm. i was not no one and done wasn't I need I needed twelve years to, <laughs> to get ready for the NBA, um, and he said, "Man, if you keep going like you're going, you might only have two years of school left." And that was the first time the thought kind of crossed my mind that, like, okay, if somebody that's played in the NBA, coached in the NBA, yeah, works out NBA players all the time, thinks that I might have a chance, maybe there's something there. So 
I just kind of put that in my back pocket, and then I just kept working hard, getting better, getting better. And then ultimately, one of my teammates, he transferred from Colorado to Little Rock. So he had played in, you know, I guess Pac-10 or whatever Colorado was in at that time. Yeah, I believe, um, I believe it was in the Pac-10 at that time. Yeah, I'm not sure what they were. Big West, I think. Or it was definitely Mountain, a something like that. Yeah. bigger, more competitive conference yes. than we yeah. were in. So he transferred to Little Rock. And he asked me, like, are you trying to go to the show? And I was like, well, what is the show? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what show are you talking about? Show? <laughs> and he's like, no, nah, to the NBA. And I was like, I mean, yeah, it's, sound good. But, I mean, it's not, you can't just decide to go, I guess. Like, that's not how it works, right? Yeah. But those couple of thoughts, you know, kind of crossed my mind. But it still never just became like a, I'm entitled to or I expect it to happen. So again, until until David Stern said my name that night of the draft, like I, I just I didn't know, to be honest. So when did you declare for the draft? So you was a senior, so you graduated. Yeah. Of course you have to declare. Mm-hmm. What was that process like? Did did you did you talk to mom and dad and say, yeah. I'm gonna do this and did you immediately get an agent or did you declare on your own and then get an agent after the fact? Yeah, so the process was interesting. It was like, um, you know, I definitely wanted to declare for the draft and and try to make it. Um, you know, basketball season ended. We went to the NIT my senior year. We lost at Vanderbilt. So this was, you know, early to mid-March. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you had to declare for the draft by April the 1st or April the 3rd or whatever it was. Um, and so – between the end of this college season and declaring for the draft. And, you know, I had kind of lost my focus and positive approach towards school because I was so distraught that the basketball season had ended. Yeah. And it possibly could have been the last basketball games I ever played. Yeah. So I, it was hard for me to get my focus back in terms of just being back only in school. I was still working out and training – and and there was a couple of um there was a um a pre draft event for seniors only called the Portsmouth Invitational. Okay. So it's in Portsmouth, Virginia, and seniors get invited. Only seniors get invited that are kind of on the cusp of like they could. So we're gonna invite them and take a closer look, but it's also a lot of them that probably not gonna be good enough to get there. Yeah. So I was basically training and getting ready for that, but I had to basically go and talk to my mom and dad and ask them for permission to withdraw from school. Oh, because school wasn't officially done no, yet. No, it wasn't done yet. Yeah. And I had basically one semester of school left to graduate. And, and how did that conversation degree. go? It wasn't fun. <laughs> it sounds like it wasn't. It was not fun. Um, but it also was a lesson in when you believe that you're capable of something and you're willing to go and sit down and talk to people that are important to you and say, no, I I think I can really do this. And if you guys are willing to work with me and figure out a way to allow me to focus on that, I think it's possible. And that's basically what the conversation was like. I basically said to my mom and dad, because I went to the Portsmouth Invitational and I came back. So I was going to like these workout things and then coming back trying to go to class. And I basically told my parents like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do both at a high level. So if, if it's okay with you guys, if I withdraw from school and just focus on getting ready for the draft, and if I don't make it to the draft or I don't get drafted, like I can go back to school the next day. School never closes. School never closes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But if I do make it, like then now we're having a completely different conversation. Doesn't mean that school closes, but – Everything is different at that yes. point. Um, so they thankfully allowed me to withdraw from school and focus on just the draft. So then that's when I was like, okay, got to hire an agent, got to start you know, getting ready, preparing myself to try to get ready for the draft. And were you at the draft? No, I was back home in Little Rock. like Watching it on TV. Watching it on TV. We, we basically, in uh, on my college campus, my my – couple of my coaches, my parents, my agent, and then my best friend um, at the time, Corliss Williamson, who 
went to Arkansas. Arkansas, yes. He was drafted the year before in the 95 draft. Okay. So he was there, and, and, like, and so we had about 10 people in the locker room. And then other family members, church members, mm-hmm. um, they had, we had a little conference room on the college campus around the corner, and they were there. So we kind of all watched the draft in a sense together, but we weren't really sure – how it was going to play out. I didn't know if I was going to get drafted at all. Yeah. You know, second round, first round, which team knew nothing. And your agent didn't have, I know nowadays agents are on the phone constantly. Was your agent on the phone with teams? Was, was he, was he kind of trying to work his, his connections or whatever? No, nah, it's, it's funny because he, excuse me, he wasn't one of those highly connected agents, you know, um, at that time. Like he was just kind of, um, he was basically my best friend's agent, you know, who I felt like I don't really necessarily want an agent that, you know, just because it's so-and-so agent, like I'd rather go with an agent that I, I've met a couple of times that I know my best friend trusts him and rock with him. Like I want to go with that guy. And then if I ain't good enough, I'm not good enough, regardless of who my agent is. That's kind of how I, I approached it. So that night, my agent really didn't know, you know, he wasn't getting the word of like, okay, if we make it to this number, you know, this team is going to draft you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the only the only understanding that I had was I think the Pistons had the 25th pick, which was one after the Lakers. I think that was the only team that implied if I get there, they probably will try and make it happen. Mm-hmm. But – it was also like the Knicks had three picks that year, 18, 19, and 21. And I felt like out of those three picks, I felt like I could have been one of those. Yeah. Um, Where did you want to go? I didn't really care, man. You just wanted to get yeah, there. <laughs> if, if a team thought I was good enough to be drafted, that was all I cared about. Now, at that time, and even still to this day to some degree, and they, they agents have kind of improved it a little bit for second rounders. Uh, where they can still carve out some guaranteed, you know, cash for those guys. But if then and now, if you get drafted in the first round and you ultimately sign your contract, like it's guaranteed for a certain amount of years. Yeah, yeah. So right off top, like you now are in a position financially that you've never been in. You're stable. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so that blessing was also why the emotion was so high because that like to be drafted in the first round, pretty much coming from nowhere. Yeah. Like, that was crazy to me. And when your name was called, what was the emotion like when your name was called in the building? In the yeah, room? it was it was straight tears, man. Yeah. As we were in the locker room uh, and we were sitting in the space where we watched film, you know, it was like a big whiteboard um, right there. And that year in the draft, there was a big guy that went to Temple named Derek Petit. And um, so, you know, David Stern gets the 24th pick. And with the 24th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Lakers select Derek. And then it kind of paused in my brain because it could have been Derek Batiste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then so then when he said, by the time he got the fish out, like, yeah, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was, like the amount of tears that came out of my, it's, it's probably why today I don't cry very much because I lost you all lost my all. tears <laughs> that, that night. Because uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around what I had just heard. And the fact that the team I grew up watching and idolizing and Magic Johnson being my favorite player of all time for the Los Angeles Lakers to draft me was also like a, because I feel like I had the worst workout for the Lakers out of everybody. I've heard you say that before in other interviews or whatever. It's, really? Yeah. Like, uh, it, was, it was at the end of the week. Because uh, depending on where you are, like, if somebody says you got to – you, they want you to come in and work out, you better go work out. Yeah. Like, some of these guys are kind of dictating, like, yeah, nah, I, I'm not working out for them. I'm only going to work out for the teams that have the top two picks or whatever. Yeah. Me, I'm like, you want me to come work out? Anybody. Yeah. yeah. I'm coming. Yeah. So, yeah. by the time I got to the Lakers workout, I think it was on a Friday – I've probably been to like Orlando, Philly, Detroit, Denver in that same week. And then so by the time I got to LA on Friday, I was gassed. Yeah. And but it, it I didn't care. It wasn't even really that. Um 
So then once the workout starts, you know, most NBA teams didn't have the fancy training facilities like they have now. So when I came to L.A., uh, Larry Drew was yes. uh, assistant coach. Mm -hmm. So he worked me out. But we at the Inglewood Y. Like, we're not at, like, oh, yeah. the I, Lakers training facility. I played at the Inglewood Y as a kid, yes. Yeah. So, so you remember how it's, slippery. It's slippery. And peanut shells, yeah. ice skating. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes. I'm trying to change direction, and I'm slipping and sliding and – you know, I didn't feel like I made a lot of shots. It just, I just didn't feel like I had given the Lakers a reason to feel like that's our guy. Was it him and you? What, was Jerry West there? Was anybody else there? Besides? Yeah, I mean, the other, you know, Jerry West, Mitch Kupchak, like other people were there. Um, Larry Drew took me through the workout. I feel like there were a couple other people. Bill Berker was probably there. Um, but I just didn't feel great yeah. about the workout, man. So, I, you know, when I got home, the Lakers were the last team I was really thinking were going to call my name, to be honest. Why did they pick you? Did you ever ask Jerry West or anybody in the organization after you got older or whatever, why did they choose you and what made them choose you? Nah, that's a – I really didn't. I felt like I tried to make sure they knew why they picked me the longer I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I do believe – because the Lakers had Nick Van Exel when they drafted me, yeah, I think there was a desire to bring somebody in that, like I was a guy that guarded people 94 feet. Mm -hmm. I picked up the ball full court. Um, you didn't need to shoot the ball either. No, tough, physical, prototypical point guard, but I could score yes. if my team needed me to. But I really wasn't looking to score. Yeah, And I think that contrast between – Nick Van Exel and myself. Because he was looking to score. Because Nick was more of a scoring guard. Yes. And and so I and then I think Jerry West also knew he was working on the Shaq deal. And he needed somebody that didn't need the shots up. And yes. Nick Van Exel was also starting to kind of ruffle feathers and kind of yeah. make some noise as well too. Yeah. So I think some of those things were factors in that, you know, even yesterday we were telling our kids after practice, like, you know, it's not just about basketball skill in terms of, like, why teams want certain type of people, certain type of players. Um, if you're a professional, good work habits, good team person, like, you bring a lot of things to the table other than just your basketball skill and talent, you give yourself a chance to stick around a little longer. 100%. And – some of those kind of like intangible things, I was more talented in those areas than certain basketball areas where other guys that were more talented than me basketball-wise, the intangibles, they weren't better than me. Yeah. They weren't as professional as me. They didn't bring the same level of focus and energy and discipline to practice or to shoot around that they would to the game. Yeah, And I always tried to approach it like everything's the same, bro. Like shoot around, I'm going hard practice I'm going hard if we run in we supposed to touch the line I'm touching the line yeah if we if the coach says do this I'm doing this like I try to strip away all the reasons why a coach or a team would feel like we don't want this we don't want him. yes that's smart that's smart I mean I think most kids nowadays need that conversation they don't have that yeah um so now 1996 NBA draft is arguably people say one of the greatest NBA drafts of all time. Yeah. It was Kobe, it was Iverson, it was Ray Allen, it was Stephon Murray. Um and they had this uh epic photo shoot. Mm -hmm. Slam magazine. Yeah. Were you invited? No. <laughs> Heck no. And, and you're the 24th <laughs> pick, so I think they invited the top 10 or whatever the case may yeah. be. Um when they when you got word that you was going to the Lakers and you got to LA what was your, when you stepped off that plane, had you been to L.A. before? No, I had never been to California, to the West Coast. The only place on the West Coast I'd been was like Seattle, Washington for a basketball tournament. <laughs> what was your thoughts, A, about that 96 class when you started to see the, the guards and stuff? And then what was your first impression of L.A. when you stepped off that plane? Yeah, my first impression of the class was like, you know, if you – you know, bear with me for a minute. In 1996, like, there hadn't been a lot of cats that came straight from high school or 
the one and done thing hadn't been a thing that long. Yeah. So in my mind, I couldn't figure out how a guy that just finished playing high school basketball mm -hmm. could go in the NBA and have any success at all. Yeah. I couldn't wrap my mind around a guy playing one year in college being actually ready to go play in the NBA against Michael Jordan. Yeah. Like Why? That. Because you thought that they were boys and those men? Yeah, boys, yeah. men that had not, like the way I was taught the game, the way I understood basketball at that point in my life, that didn't make sense. Yeah. Like, you, surely they need more coaching or training or something because the NBA is like, that's the hardest, most challenging basketball environment you can be in. So they definitely need more than just high school, right? Yeah. And they did, like we all do. Right? Even if they're one and done, they come straight from high school, like – there's still kind of a transition that every player goes through. Um, even last night watching NBA basketball, they were showing the 84 draft and, uh, you know, Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley being yeah. in that draft. Both of those guys, uh, Michael Jordan's first game, he had like 16 points, you know, nothing crazy. He had 56 points. Yeah. Charles Barkley had 15 points, but he came off the bench. Mm -hmm. A lot of Hall of Fame guys came off the bench to start to start their NBA careers. Um, so so the, only, the really the only guy that in the draft that I kind of circled as like, I wonder what could have happened differently was Steve Nash. Okay. Because I respected Steve's game. Like, I, and you know, he's from Santa Clara. I respected guys that went to mid-major, smaller schools. Like, yeah. I knew he could play. We worked out at some of the same teams at the same time. But what had started to happen around the league was like certain agents and guys that didn't want certain exposure to certain situations, they would say, okay, we can do these things, but we can't do these things. Mm. So two or three of the times that Steve Nash and I were working out in the same place, you know, we would do all the shooting drills, all the individual things, and then it was time to play two-on-two, three-on-three. Three. He couldn't do that. Ah, because they didn't want to expose him just in case something happened. Yeah. They didn't want to make – because then you, as the low-level guy, may yeah. jump ahead of him because you didn't ball Correct. him up. So, yeah, that makes sense. And that all that, that stuck with me still to this day. Like, so whenever we played the Phoenix Suns or any like, team he was on, like, it was personal. Not because really? okay. Steve and I had beef, but it just was like I know in my soul that – in a two on two, three on three setting, I would have been able to do things to prove that I'm just as good yeah. or better in some areas. Do you feel like he got your spot? Do you feel like, because I don't know when he got drafted, but he was ahead of you, 13, of course. No, 16, I think. I think the the fact that you even know that, <laughs> meaning that you circled him on yeah. the calendar, yeah. did you feel like going through that draft process, seeing him withhold certain things that, oh, he's he got my spot? Yeah, not not got my spot like, uh, man, I, I feel like I could have been better than him. They catered to him a little bit more, so you felt yeah, like... Yeah, I just, I just feel like, and this could be in the bad way as well, right? Like, yeah. let's say we swap draft spots. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve could have played on five NBA championship teams, and yeah, maybe I could have done some of the individual things that he did, but would I still and have enjoyed my career the same? Yeah. I don't know. So that when I think of it, it's more like not he got my spot like, oh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm better than Steve Nash, but I don't know why they draft. No, Steve is a Hall of Fame legend. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was for me. But at the time when the things are happening, you're like, okay, I, I, I see what they did in draft. Oh, this is a guy that they're kind of putting ahead of me. Let me make sure that I have a good showing. Yeah. And – yeah. Go out there. Yeah. What right. about the rest of the guards? I mean, did you ever encounter like Stefan Marbury or Allen Iris and those guys before the draft or before you got into the NBA? No, it was uh me and Steph, I think I'm trying to think if Steph was in Phoenix. Because there used to be there was a Portsmouth invitational, that was the first combine. Mm -hmm. Then they would they had a pre draft combine in Phoenix. And then the big one, like the main one, was in Chicago. And it still is, like, yeah. in, in in Chicago. So I'm trying to remember if Steph and I 
battled a little bit in Phoenix. Um, once we got to Chicago, I know Allen Iverson didn't participate. A lot of the top guys didn't participate once we got to, again, like the five on five and live type of things. Mm -hmm. um, they did the medical testing and some of the interviews and stuff. Um, and that, that still happens today. Like, yeah. There's a lot of guys that don't participate. I think some of the rules are changing and they're, they're, they're going to at least require guys to show up and participate in some things. But, you know, I, I don't really wish it went down differently. Honestly, like I think my journey was my journey. I mean, you won five championships. And I mean, what else could? It be? Yeah, like I, you know, those guys are all star, Hall of Fame type dudes. Like, I don't really resent or have any feelings towards them personally, yeah, or that like, yeah. man, I could have been that. Like, I, I wasn't that. That yeah. wasn't really for me. Like, I was best suited to be part of a great collection of guys, and then almost more like an orchestrator or like a DJ to some degree mm -hmm. that just kind of like these people that made these great songs, like as a DJ, you kind of figure out how to blend and how yeah. to keep the crowd moving out, but you didn't make the song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I was best suited to be around guys that made the great songs. Mm -hmm. And then my job was to try to figure out how to blend it. And every now and then blend myself in there a little bit, but for the most part, like, let the great ones be the great ones. Mm -hmm. um, your first impression of L.A., when you stepped off the plane, what was your first thoughts? Where'd you go? Like, you got, so Lakers fly you in. Was it private or was it commercial? It was commercial. Commercial. Yeah. So you fly in. Of course, nobody knows who you are, so you're flying. No. You're like, and you're not very tall. Not like, that guy must be in the NBA. Yeah, no. So it's not like you're seven feet tall. They had yeah. that. So you walk in there. Lakers pick you up. What was your first impression? Where did you go the first yeah, I was I was a like, you know, a point A to point B dude. Like if I don't know my way around, if uh -huh. I don't really know like I'm supposed to move to the left or to the right in this area and then you knew I knew enough not you to You heard stories. Yeah, you can't okay. be pulling up just wherever. Yeah. So I was, you know, airport most of the time the team would have somebody meet you or, you know, pick you up, mm -hmm. you know, take you to the facility or the office. So that, you know, paperwork, different things, HR stuff, you got to start signing and getting that going right away. Yeah. And then you go to your hotel, you know, because I wasn't for sure. Like, I could have not made the team in a sense. So you was locked in. Like, I'm so, not going to go out and party. Yeah, I'm not going to try nah, to see no sights. I'm I'm here for a specific reason. Yeah. I feel, And I feel like that's the only way. I want to say the only way. That's the way I best survived, like, that transition, you know, into L.A. is like, I have a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I know where my job is. It's a high pressure, you know, performance based job. Yeah. So I can't do anything that's going to negatively impact my performance. Yeah. And so that includes trying to be out too much and trying to drink, smoke, do whatever that is going to negatively impact my performance. I can't really rock with that. What was your first L.A. thing you did? Did you go to the beach? Did you go to Roscoe's? What was your first L.A. thing you did? Get stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh out the airport, hop on a four or five. Where are you going? You gonna be stuck in traffic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think probably the first LA thing I did was pull out that Thomas guide. So for you young cats <laughs> that don't understand, yeah. we we have a phone that has a map on it. You can put an address in it, it directs you around. There was this book called the Thomas Guide that that was I'm talking about like Bible thick that had all the streets and all the things. And you flipped it open. And you said, I want to go to Hollywood. And it was like a map, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much your phone was in a book. Right. And people had these in their trunks, their cars, and they updated it every six months, a year, whatever. So you put out a Thomas Guide to go where? Um, I mean, mainly to UCLA. Okay. Because they used to do open runs at UCLA. Still do. Yeah. At UCLA Men's Gym. That was pretty much the farthest I went. Like, I would just, you know, go from the hotel Look at the Thomas guy. Like, I used to literally take Sepulveda all the way north or south, wherever. I wasn't really all trying town, to yes. mess with the freeway that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, did so, you, yeah. Did you, you drove yourself, or did you have yeah. a driver? I would drive myself. Um, my best friend and my cousin, they moved out here with me. That's good. So I kind of had a couple guys that I knew and trusted. I didn't really have to try to go find some friends out here when I moved here. Yeah. Um, so sometimes they would go as well, but... Um, 
Yeah, man. L.A. traffic was serious then. Different. Yes. Serious now. And who was the first Laker that you met once once you got to L.A. and you started working out? Who was the first Laker you met that was on the team? Um, I think it was like Nick Van Exel, okay. Eddie, some of the guys that used to go to UCLA open runs. Mm, okay. And I remember, you know, going to play, and we didn't really know each other necessarily. You knew of each other. You knew of each other. And Magic was still kind of playing a little bit as well, mm-hmm. but he would he would he would be there sometimes. And so I remember like certain days where like Nick was out there cooking and playing good and definitely probably trying to show me. That was you know, my next question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like what's up and and at certain times like Magic reacted a certain way and did certain things and not like I just remember internalizing you know all of those things that like never made me feel a certain way personally about anybody but just continue to drive and form that competitive you understood spirit what you needed to do yeah yeah were they was it a warm reception when you met those yeah, guys yeah yeah nick was great eddie jones was great both of those guys lived in the culver city area which wasn't far like i ended up getting a an apartment in marina del rey because at that time we practiced at like Loyola Marymount and yeah. places that were more on the west side. So Nick and Eddie living in Culver City wasn't far. So, you know, they would invite me over to the crib. Like they were they were young, even though they were kind of veteran guys. Yeah. Like they had been in the league for three or four years, mm-hmm. even and they were still only 25, 26 years old. And when was your first time meeting Kobe? What was your mm-hmm. thoughts when the Lakers drafted this high school kid and you're like, oh, they dropped the high school kid? What was your first yeah. thought? Yeah, no, I that was my thought. It was like, there's no way a kid from high school is ready to play in the league, bro. Like, I, I just didn't understand that. It yeah. didn't make sense in my brain. Um, and what was your first encounter with him? Yeah, probably training camp, really. I don't think we met each other before camp started. Um, was he always as intense as everybody says he is? Or focus, I should say. Yeah, he was, and and then even at seventeen years old. Yeah, he was young, so it also was like, you know, there was a lack of maturity to a certain degree that also leads to kind of like a, like I'm not sure about these situations. I'm not a grown man. I don't know. Like, do I do what they do? Do I stay to myself? Like, what you know? I can't go to some of the places they go. I, you know, whatever it is. So, I just feel like. Kobe was also a very laser focused guy on basketball. Mm-hmm. He wasn't really in the league for the lifestyle part of it. Yeah. So that also is what once we kind of started spending time together, you know, after practices, working out, um, you know, early in our careers, we didn't play a lot of minutes. So the the next day in practice, we had to do extra stuff together. Mm-hmm. So we'd have to get extra shots up, extra running, you know, two on two. Full court, one on one, picking each other up. Full court, so those that's where we kind of started forming our relationship was really through the sweat equity, you know, working out on the court. He called you his favorite teammate. Yeah, it was crazy. That was dope. How did that make you feel? Um, I, it was kind of interesting because I, I like people were telling me that he was saying that. I didn't hear him say that. Yeah, I didn't see the interview. Um, so then, and people mentioned it and then, you know, I was on social media, like certain things just kind of pop up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, I wasn't surprised because of how much success we had together. Uh-huh. Like I know, and I know that mattered to him, but there's obviously a lot of guys he could have chosen or said, uh, that he enjoyed playing with as much or more than me. So for him to say me like that is just, yeah. Why do you think he picked you? Um, I think there were very few people that could venture into the realm of competitiveness and drive and focus and obsession with winning that he could. And so I think that's what he felt about me that there were a lot of similarities in those areas. Talent, not even close. But you guys had the same type of chip on your shoulder because you came from a smaller school, wasn't supposed to be here. He also came from high school 
everybody's doubting if he should be here or not. So yeah. you guys kind of had the same chip on your shoulder. Yeah, and and like just we just wanted to win really, really bad. Yeah. So I, I think over the years, I, I just don't think he came across very many people that were willing to stay as disciplined and as focused long enough to win once, twice, three times, four times. Yeah. But like it's just a very small number of people that have the mental ability beyond the physical part to like achieve that. And I think that's what connected us probably the most. What was your favorite championship or fa- fa- favorite Laker time? Um, yeah, I don't, it's a good question. I've, it's a couple of them that come to mind, but probably I think 2009, you know, was unique because it was, you know, for Kobe, it was a big moment because that was the first championship without Shaq. You know, people had questioned all these years whether or not he could win a title without Shaq. And so it was a completely different version of our team. Um, and I think for me, my role was different. You know, by the time we got to 09, I was, you know, I was in my mid-30s. It was, you know, I had a lot of these great experiences. But, you know, in a lot of ways, what – the team needed from me in 09 in order to win a championship was different than the last time we'd won in 02. Yeah. Um, And I enjoyed that, um, the need to have to perform at a high level every night for us to win. Like Mm -hmm. if I didn't play well, we could still win, but some of our biggest performances and moments and games, like I had to help us get it over the hump and that was was a good feeling. So – how was it playing with Kobe Bryant on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, like playing with Kobe on a day-to-day basis was um like it was it was motivating in a sense. Like you you like seeing someone every day that is like trying to figure out how to be the one of the best to ever do something, like watching them watching their process every day, seeing how they move, um, how competitive he was. Like he just raised the level of everything whenever he walked in the room. Like people just, you felt his presence. So being around that every day, it's like, well, damn, okay, well, I want some of that, you know? I wanna- Did you guys have that conversation about him wanting to do that or was there any? No, you know what? He never really said it I just I feel like that was one advantage that I had over everybody that was trying to figure him out I felt like I picked up early the fact that like now this dude is thinking about 20 years from now yeah (laughs) like he's not just uh, just showing up for practice like this is a journey that he has decided he's going on and he wants to be one of the greatest basketball players to ever play period so i i believe that that gave me a little more advantage when it came to having certain levels of patience and compassion for when he would have moments that would frustrate all of us but i felt like i could absorb it differently because I knew he wasn't just thinking about well I'm just trying to get 30 because like I want to score 30 it's really deeper than that Hmm. and I felt like I I sensed that like it wasn't 30 to just to get 30 to pump my chest that I got 30 it's like I truly believe the work that I put in makes me capable of doing these things and if I can do these things on a consistent basis, I can lead my team to winning championships as much or more than the great ones that came before. And that helped my legacy as well, too. So, yeah. I mean, winning ultimately is part of that legacy. Yes. And it's why now that he's physically not here anymore, we regard him a certain way. Yeah. If he didn't have that mentality, the Mamba mentality. Exactly, right. Then we would, like, <laughs> his statistical numbers would be what they are, but we just wouldn't feel about it the same way but it was the mentality that separated him so then to your question like being around him every day 
it's like being around somebody with that kind of mentality. If that doesn't rub off on you, bro, you did something wrong. Did you ever get into altercations, fights, any any anything with Kobe that you can talk about? Yeah, like not fist fights, like we were punching each other, but fights from a competitive standpoint of like, nah, bro, but we will punch each other in the next two seconds if this continues down this path. Like we we were that competitive. So, um, like I mentioned, when we were rookies, we would you know some days after practice after a game like I remember specifically in Milwaukee we had a game against the Bucks uh, coming up the next day and we had come from maybe Chicago or Indiana or somewhere and so we had practice and then after practice you know the young guys or guys that didn't play that many minutes you're getting some extra work in or whatever and so then that day after a little bit of time like it was just Kobe and I in the gym and maybe a, a, an assistant coach or somebody just kind of sticking around. So we were working out, and then we played. We used to play full court one on one. So we picking each other up wow. full court. <laughs> you know, it had to be intense. Oh man, and we turning each other, and yeah, you know, back then you could hand check, so it was super physical. And like Kobe used to have, like he had these little tricks in his game that. NBA veteran guys had he had that at 18 uh -huh. so like if you're hand checking him when he starts driving to the basket like he knew how to move his arm and knock your arm off that and then it would throw you off balance and then he that's how he could get to the basket mm. and it was just little tricks and little gimmicks that like veteran dudes had he had that at 18 I had never played against nobody that did all that I personally felt like, why are you fouling me and you on offense? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we going, we going, and after a while, I'm like, damn, this dude, he's hitting me more than I'm hitting him, and he got the ball. Yeah. So, you know, I'm guarding him, and we, and it had happened enough times to where I'm like, all right, hold on, like, this can't continue because if he keeps hitting me this way when he's on offense, it's gonna be a problem. So he made a move and whatever, and he like almost like again he fouled me. I felt like I'm on defense, he's on offense. Why is he hitting me so hard? Yeah. So I just I kind of grabbed him and we just stopped. And I was like, bro, look, <laughs> we can drop this basketball right now and just get straight to it. <laughs> if it's like if it's gonna be this physical, then we might as well just fight and wrestle for real. Like, yeah. Just, yeah. Let's just take the basketball part out. If you foul me like that on offense one more time, like we just let's just go. And it wasn't really to like actually fight. It was really more it was just a point where I felt like I had to stand my ground as a competitor. You're not gonna do that to me. Yeah. I don't care what's who happening, you are, who what, you are, yeah. like you're just not gonna do that. And I think that experience early in our careers established a bond between the two of us that like, okay, so now I know I got somebody that's willing to die for this like I am. Mm. So you, th you think he was testing you? Yeah. I th and I think he tested a lot of guys that... Some passed, some didn't. Some passed and some didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's fast for a little bit. You know, you had an illustrious 18-season career. Man. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. when you look back on your career, what stands out the most to you? Yeah, I think the the longevity of it uh, probably stands out the most. Like, you know, as a guy that was kind of on the fringe in the sense of maybe being drafted or not and not really a superstar, never made an all-star team, you know, I think the longevity of it is what stands out because it it confirms for me what I had always believed and still believe to this day that like winning kind of solves everything. Whatever you want more of, just win, and it'll take care of the rest. If yeah. You want, if you want another contract, win. Just win, right? Okay. If you're a coach and you want an extension. <laughs> Just win. Yeah. If you're a player that, you know, you you come off the bench and you want to start one day or whatever, just win. By any means necessary. If you got to 
dive on the ground foosball, hit a yeah. shot or whatever. Just win. Yeah. Because you, you're you're creating that that longevity and that that greater window mm-hmm. with winning than than you are if if not. Um, and so that's what kind of stands out to me. Like I I was fortunate enough to play for a lot of great teams as a kid, mm-hmm. and so I think that like stuck with me even into my professional career where like if my team won you know the state championship in AAU like for the next year bro I'm the champ yeah right <laughs> you know and so you wore that yeah yeah so so if I you know other guys that we went to the same school and we played on the same team at school mm-hmm. different club teams so then we would be cool during the school season and then as soon as that school season ended, it's it's on in the hallway. Yeah, right. <laughs> like now we walk past homies, each yeah. other, we not homies like that. Because yeah. now we on two different teams. Yeah. But what gave me the ability to like come back to school that next year and be like Cause you won. Because our team won a state championship and yeah. yours didn't. So yeah. that um I think that's what allowed me to have such a long career is that People knew I wasn't Shaq, I wasn't Kobe, I wasn't an all-star caliber player to, to you know, many degrees, but the winning habits and characteristics and attributes that coaches want, that front office executives are looking for, that high school coaches are looking for, people at every, like, I embodied those things, and that's why I was able to stay in the league as long as I did. That's awesome. I mean... It goes to what we talked about before, even off air, as far as these kids need to learn how to be a teammate and yeah. be serviceable for their teams, no matter if you're scoring or not. So that's good to hear. So you were also the player rep uh, for the NBA as well, too. What, yeah. did, what did you learn in that role? And did that role help you to do exactly what you're doing now? Yeah, no, I. Um, so in, in 1999. Um, that was the first, and from my experience, that was the first, you know, lockout in terms of collective bargaining agreement in the NBA. And there was a big player meeting in Las Vegas. And that was, you know, Carl Malone, John Stockton, Michael Jordan, like all the stars came out. Mm-hmm. Historically, the superstar guys really didn't spend that much time on the Players Association business. It wasn't, wasn't their role. They were the superstars of the league. They pay the bills because of who they are. And then other guys take care of the politics. Yeah. So I, we went to that meeting in 1999 in Las Vegas, and I remember feeling like I wasn't quite sure of what exactly was going on other than, like, we having a lockout, we having these big meetings, but I don't understand the nuances of this. I don't understand the details of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Why is this happening what exactly is this about? And so I remember leaving that meeting in 99 saying, uh, I don't like how this feels. I'm never going to let this happen again. And that's what led to me getting heavily involved in Players Association business. Because mm-hmm. I just didn't like that feeling of being a part of something. I didn't really understand what was going on. And it's containing your future. It's yes. your future. So your future and your finances is based on these decisions that you know nothing about. Yeah. And I just, I didn't want to not know anything about those decisions anymore. So I started getting involved. I became the player representative most of the time for teams that I played on. Mm -hmm. So that was from 2000 to 2006. And, and, you know, I was like a player rep for my teams and I became a vice president on the executive committee. And then ultimately I became president of the Players Association in 2007, six and held that position for about seven years. And I think those experiences definitely continued this understanding of leadership responsibilities, relationship dynamics, politics, um, but also like being a guy that has always been willing to take less or not worry about myself as much and do what's best for the group. And so when you're involved in the Players Association or you're the president of the Players Association, it's not really about you at all. Like you're trying to help put together 
as many positive situations for the players and most of the players that aren't in the league now. It's either things that are going to be beneficial to the guys that came before us or things that's going to be beneficial for the guys coming in or the young guys, you know, when you're going to be gone when this stuff kicks in. Yeah. So like the foundational agreement that led to where things are now financially for the guys was the 2011 collective bargaining agreement. Oh yeah. Which I was on the front lines of that. You know, I'm in the meetings with NBA owners and David Stern and I really trying to figure this out. Um, and I think also the, the media scrutiny that came with that role, it provided a sense of confidence that when I decided to go coach the Knicks, I felt like I could handle the media part of coaching the Knicks because the media part with the Players Association was heavy around that time when, when we were negotiating collective bargaining agreements. Like, it was a big deal. And a lot of those meetings were in New York City. So when you would come out of a long day of negotiations with the NBA, like you got to face all this media and answer to the questions. And why didn't you guys reach a deal? And what are the sticking points? And, you know, so I felt that ask like basketball media questions were easy compared to yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> compared to questions about, you know, billions of dollars that yeah. we were negotiating on you know, during players association meetings. 